Hey everyone, this is Tim McDonald coming to you with Community Manager Hangout like we do every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And we are also, in addition to being on, whether you're watching on YouTube, watching on Google+, um, or you might possibly just be on Twitter. And if you're not on Twitter but want to join the conversation there as well, you can actually use the hashtag CMGR Hangout. And we have both Sherry Rohde and Brandy McCollum over there handling the at MyCMGR Twitter account and their own personal ones. And they will be joining the conversation and keeping the conversation going on there. Uh, but if you do want to join in the Hangout, just go to the My Community Manager page on Google+, Plus. look for the event, The Story Factor, which is what we named this, and you should see a link in the comments for that event to actually join on camera. If you join on camera, we expect you to actually be on camera. We expect you to actually speak up and talk and engage in the conversation. That is part of our rules. Um, if you don't want to do that, just watch the YouTube video. Don't join on camera and comment along, and we will get with you there. So I am very excited today because I think when we talk about community management, and you know, a lot of community management is social media, and a lot of social media is marketing, and regardless of what aspect we're at, it's all about business. And in business, I don't think there's any more effective method of communicating than storytelling. And a lot of marketers know that, and I think especially with social media, we hear a lot about storytelling. But um, our guest today, Annette Simmons, is somebody who wrote the book, The Story Factor, which I read um, back in January during Community Manager Appreciation Day during our one-year anniversary of Community Manager Hangout and during my wedding. Um, so I was reading your book while I was on my honeymoon and getting married, and I just said at that point in time that we really needed to get you on one of these Hangouts. So thank you so much for being here, Annette. Well, sure. I can't believe that um, uh, it rated honeymoon you know, time reading, but I'm, I'm proud of that, you know. <laughs> well, that was, the, that was the daytime my... reading, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but what I like to do is just go ahead and get everybody to um, go ahead and introduce themselves really quick. We go in alphabetical order, just like in grade school, but I'm going to skip over Annette and come back to you and let you have the big introduction. So if we can real quick just go through and remember when it comes to you, just go ahead and unmute yourself if you're muted. So Aaron, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. I'm, I'm really excited about today's things, and Annette's book is awesome, and the story, I could be more excited about this idea of storytelling. I think it's key. You know, I do a lot of storytelling in, in film production and video production at Attention Area Media, and I couldn't agree more that it's a big thing, and I'm really looking forward to today's Hangout. So, Well, excellent. Glad to have you back with us second week in a row. Good to, right. good to have you. It's attention. been great. Yeah. And so uh, we'll come back to you, Annette. And so how are you doing, David? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm David Deal. I'm a marketing executive, and i uh, Looking forward to learning today and contributing. I was actually just blogging about the art of visual storytelling and how visual storytelling can help a company uh, share its culture. So it's great to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. And uh, another, uh, we have two people coming back for the second week in a row. This is a very good sign. So, and uh, Garrick, how you doing? We still don't hear you. Are you unmuted? Well, maybe check the sound on that. We'll go to Garrett while Garrett's checking that out. Hey, I'm Garrett. I'm with Argyle Social. I'm a community manager over here. I do a whole bunch of other stuff, too. Um, and in terms of storytelling, I, I love uh, uh, comics and, and the way that they can tell stories through uh, words and through visuals. Fantastic stuff. Excellent. Now I can tell Garrick has sound. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Hi, I'm back. Uh, my name is Garrick. I am the digital communications manager for a staffing firm called Satya Solutions here in Los Angeles. Nice to meet everybody. Good to have you back. Good to see you. It's been a few weeks, I think, since we've seen you. So. <laughs> uh, and Jillian, how are you doing today? And you're muted, too. There we go. Unmuted. <laughs> I'm doing all right. Um, Hi everybody, I'm Jillian. Um, I am currently uh, looking for my next job, so I'm not. I don't have an affiliation. I'm affiliated with me. Where are you located again, Jillian? I'm in New York. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. And my right hand mute man, Brew. How you doing? 
Hi. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here. As always, I'm Brew, uh, Director of Awesome with BTC Revolutions, um, doing all things community management and uh, social and digital. Excellent. And Krista, how are you doing today? Hi, it's Friday, so that's good. If, if we're on a hangout, it's usually Friday. <laughs> Yep, uh, I'm Krista, and I work at Motion Loft, which is a, um, a data company based out of San Francisco. Fantastic, and I am Tim McDonald. I am the founder of My Community Manager, which hosts online and offline events for community managers and anybody interested in community management, um, including these Hangouts and also Community Manager Unconferences, which our next one is up in Toronto on August 17th. And uh, my paying job and what I actually do for a living is work here at the Huffington Post, and most of you are used to hearing me say I am the community manager for HuffPost Live, which is the live streaming network of the Huffington Post, but this week I was promoted to the director of community for all of Huffington Post, so um, I have a new title to share today. So. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, but without further ado, I do want to let Annette introduce herself, um, and I am just so excited to have you here, but I always like to hear it directly from our guest um, to, for you to tell us a little bit about who you are, um, what you do, and kind of how you got into what you're doing. And to, you need to unmute yourself. I think we Brew had to mute you when the introductions were going on. Okay. There okay. you go. How about that? Perfect. Okay. I uh, come from the behavioral sciences. And so, when uh, I I had, can you hear me? Okay. So, I had my training was in psychology and behavior change, and when my I wanted to study psychology when I was in in college, and my dad said that'll be use, useless. So study marketing, which is really just psychology. And uh, did some international business for, for 10 years, lived in Australia. And then I just wanted to go back to the psychology thing again. So I was studying why do people not talk to each other. I don't know if you've ever been in a meeting where it felt like people were just bleeding IQ points. But I, I then did research on that that turned out to be the book Territorial Games. Back in 1997, it was an issue of people being protective and territorial. And then after that, it became obvious that storytelling was the best tool I had to get two warring parties to talk to each other. And then it was the best tool I had to, in uh, adult education to train people. And then I realized uh, you know, it's the best tool for marketing as well. And one of my friends, when I was talking to him about this, said, you know, you should write a book about that. And uh, I did, and that was in 2000, that book came out. The one you just read was originally published in, in 2000. And so um, I have learned so much, and it's always been from the, from the standpoint of what creates an action. What is it that, you know, and, and so when I look at storytelling, I'm not just looking at it to entertain. I'm looking at what does it do in terms of somebody's response. Oh, and then I wrote Whoever Tells the Best Story Wins as kind of a textbook. And uh, a lot of people use either Story Factor or wh Whoever Tells the Best Story Wins as textbook and marketing class. Well, and i got to tell you, um, a lot of people here have either heard me speak e either on a hangout or at an event. And one of my sayings that I've become almost known for, Annette, is that social media marketing is like a bulldozer and community management is like a magnet. And I took that from right. your description of what a good storyteller was about. Yeah, I thought I recognized that. Yeah, that's a great metaphor, isn't it? It is, it is. So I told everybody they were going to actually know where that came from, and it came from reading your book, actually. I didn't I didn't copy it verbatim, but I took the same metaphor and I applied it towards um, social media marketers compared to community managers and really the, the goals and the effects that we both have as far as how we communicate with the audience. So. I think that's cool. That makes sense. <laughs> so, um, well, let's go ahead and get started with the first question. Um, and I, I really, you know, I, I mean, I love the fact of, of how you got into this and, and, you know, that you're talking about it from a business standpoint, but maybe you can just expand on that a little bit more by telling us, you know, why is storytelling so important 
in business? Well, storytelling is important um, to being a human being. I mean, it's, it's so deep that you start there. There is nothing that is meaningful without a story that makes it so. So, so if something is good or something is bad, that actually is a, the result of a, the story you tell yourself about that something. So in business, I mean, our entire you know focus is to create good so that people value it enough to exchange money for it. Well, or that people take our ideas within a corporation if that's where we work. And so it's all about, everything is all about the story that people believe about your product, about your idea, and so we have power to alter the story they believe by changing how we tell that story. And so all meaning is a function of the story that you tell as well as the story that events tell. I mean you can't tell, you know, Luckily, it's it's hard to create a whole story that's not based in reality. I think that's a good thing, but how we present it dramatically um, affects what people believe. Uh, oh, I just I, I'm like doing multiple screens, and I came back, and there was a blank screen for a minute, um, which was a weird feeling. So, no, this I I really like this, and and I I just want to you know open it up to everybody else. Does anybody else have any questions about that? Have any other thoughts to add on to that? Because I'd really like to hear your definition of what you consider storytelling. Well, I was going to jump in and say, you know, the when I when I think of good storytellers, those are always the people I remember. Um, that's why I think storytelling is so important. Um, I think back even to my younger days, uh, compared to camp, um, and I probably had many camp counselors throughout my uh, time going to camp as a kid. But the ones I remember were the ones who, at the fire late at night, were telling the most engaging stories. Um, and those are the people still today, um, you know, that I that I that I know and follow and and everything else. So, I think right. using, using that. That's go ahead, Aaron. Right, no, I was right on with that. You know, and the same with companies. You know, you know, telling is not selling. I remember that phrase back in the day. But you know, I think that companies that actually package all of their facts and you know the things that are good about their products or services and tell their story actually, like Bruce said, these are the people we remember. These are the companies we remember. You know, the I mean, one of the reasons why I think in some cases Harley Davidson is so big because the stories that go along with this American motorcycle and this freedom that they tell. You know, they just make an engine that you ride around on two wheels, but they've turned it into this giant storytelling map of, you know, everything. And I think that's partly why they are so successful as well as, you know, obviously all the other companies. Yeah, just on Harley, I, when I lived in Australia, I was best friends with the guy who had that account, and that was like 1986 and uh, you know they had storytelling down even then and I think it was about being real clear about who they are and who they aren't which is right. a big aspect of storytelling not trying to be everything to everybody right right and their museum that they have now just plays right into that it's actually their museum is actually a part of their company it's their one of their marketing divisions is their museum you know and that's where they I mean they spent hundreds of millions of dollars just telling their story on that and it's effective. I mean I think in the next month 100,000 people are going to come to Milwaukee just to celebrate their 110th anniversary. So wow. <laughs> they want to tell that story. Yep. Yeah. I think they learned that though from a past mistake back in the 70s when they sold out and went to AMF. They learned and almost went out of business. They learned how poor how bad that worked. So they, they right. you know, we learned from failure and now they came back even stronger understanding that. Oh, that's cool. That's a good story, I'm sure. I'd love to hear more about that. <laughs> you know what's... Uh, uh, oh, go ahead. Gettysburg, Gary. About, you want... Well, back in the 70s, they, they sold to a company called AMF, and what happened was the product was vastly uh, inferior, and the bikes were rotting out, and they were getting... They got a really bad reputation, and finally uh, Harley came back in the owners of the family came back in and bought the company back and oh, cool. built it to what it is now. I mean, it was 
it was doing fine. It wasn't anywhere near the success that it had that you know where it's at now. But when they sold it to AMF, that's when everything went really downhill. And actually, right. if you ha if you have one of those bikes, they're kind of um, kind of a little badge to own one of those because not many of them made it through. <laughs> they were real poorly built. Well, that kind of, is that kind of like a pacer too, Jerry? <laughs> yeah. You got, yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, one of the things, too, you know, part of that merging in is they lost their story a little bit. They become, you know, part of a catalog of, of recreational vehicles instead of just being their own thing. And I think, That's obviously, right. the quality was part of it, too, no doubt. But, uh, you know, when you start taking something like Harley-Davidson with its history and you stop telling that story and you just put it into a portfolio of things, I, I think that's obviously one of the biggest things that happened besides the quality. So I'd, I'd like to throw a question out, if you, if you all don't mind. Um, one of the things I've always appreciated about great storytellers is how they inject theater to what they do. Um, Steve Jobs was a master of storytelling. When Apple would unveil a new product, um, he, he turned every product launch into theater. He, he used elements of storytelling like narrative, conflict, uh, even character development when he would lead up to the great unveil of the next iPhone. But that Experience takes time. If you if you ever seen videos of him on stage unveiling a product, so that he really relished in the experience. How do you do that in the rapid fire world of social media, which people just don't have a whole lot of time to to give to you? And and most of us are not Steve Jobs unveiling a new iPhone. It's I I don't have I an answer. In, I just thought I'd throw that out. I think in the world of social media, people have a lot more time than they let on uh, if they're <laughs> actively engaged. Um, that's and, a good and, point. And it's, it's, you know, I have time to sit down and watch two seasons of The West Wing, but I don't have time to watch a 20-minute or a 20-second video because I've never heard of this guy before. But if the story engages me and if it catches me, mm -hmm. then it's something that, it, it's something that I can, can get into. And that's something that Steve Jobs did very well with. He used much slower pacing uh, because, you know, going up and telling a story is all about timing uh, and making sure your timing is correct. And his timing was fantastic where he could go and stand on a stage and wait and people <laughs> would wait for him to speak because they loved his timing so much and he knew the exact second to speak up, he knew the exact yeah. second to not speak any longer and with that command of timing he could slow down the conversation, he could develop a story and he could create a character that you wanted to listen to. Yeah, I'd like to talk, I mean Steve Jobs obviously is um, amazing and, and one of the things that creates amazing is what you're concentrated on when you do the storytelling so if concentrating if you concentrate on the story in terms of the narrative mm -hmm. um, that's one thing and people tend to concentrate on on accuracy or you know what is the story I think it works better to concentrate on what is the emotion that you're creating. And when you concentrate on that as your outcome, the emotion is your outcome, then what happens is that the story starts to develop itself and in certain circumstances if people don't have a lot of time, perhaps the story develops itself into, um, you know, even to the point of what our background is behind us as we speak right now. That's part of our story. And so in, in a split second, we're telling part of our story. So even the shortest communication can tell something. And, you know, I've, uh, I have yellow walls uh, because I love saffron. I like the color. And, and so it's the emotion I'm going for, and so that's, that's how I made that choice. But when you look at uh, storytelling orally, what Steve Jobs did was he was – he created emo he created suspense through that pause and so you can pause a long time and you can create awkwardness <laughs> or you can create suspense and so it's it's i think that the the best um the best uh tool for me is to concentrate on what is the emotion that i'm trying to create and then all of my communications, every single touch that someone experiences is telling part of my story. 
Well, and the emotion part is a big part of it for me as well. Like, I'm a, I'm a big movie fan, and one of the things that grabs me about movies isn't necessarily the setting, but, like, in, in a scary movie, when you're sitting there and you're just like, all right, all right, he's going to pop out, it's going to happen, and you feel that emotional connection, that's what we're looking for when we when we tell stories or when we listen to stories is to feel something. And more so than the framework of there's a hero and there's a villain and he kills a guy and then he goes and does this thing and then he saves the world. It's that guy has to go through trouble, that guy has to go through triumph, that guy has to go through every aspect and you yeah. accompany them on that journey. Yeah. Right on. Right on. Well, uh, go ahead. I was going to ask, um, who do you think, as a brand, does a great job of, of creating emotion? You, do you, this is what I love about these Hangouts, because I think David's actually taken in his last question, uh, questions two, four, and three, and now he's gone back and asked question five, all, all with, before I even got it. <laughs> Sorry. <out. So. laughs> but you know what this shows me? Is I do a good job at coming up with the questions. <laughs> So why don't you go ahead and, and answer that, Annette, if you have some examples of some brands that have done a good job with storytelling, and I'll go ahead and tweet out question five as number three. So. <laughs> well, okay, this I have to make a confession here, and that is that I was very ill and, and really unable to, to, to be in, to learn about technology but from 2010, 2011, and 2012. So you guys just imagine not knowing anything you learned in those three years, okay? And so I've come back, and I'm well now. I feel great. And now I'm learning from scratch. And so I am I feel like I'm starting to catch up. But what's cool is that I've had a snapshot that's like three years later. And I look at everything, and um, I, I'm finding that there's a lot of stuff that's all about the technology that people are looking at you know what they can do instead of necessarily what they should do I, I'll give you one example that is B2B um, and internal PricewaterhouseCoopers has done a great job with their diversity storytelling um, you can go to their website and just type in diversity and I think what you'll see is a series of videos a series of communications that really tells the story of diversity within that organization and outside so you know we're having a look from the outside in so when um, the movie The Dark Knight came out I don't know the Batman movie um, there was actually a advertising agency that did uh, a story based campaign it was called an alternate reality game where at a comic convention a picture of Uncle Sam appeared and he had the big joker smile with blacked out eyes and some random digits written below it and that was a decoded turned out to be a time and a location and if you showed up at that time and the location there was a plane flying above head that wrote out a phone number that then you called and then they gave you the next clue of the place to go and at some point you got the joker mask and, and uh, an entire posse of people and you stopped outside of a bank and then the bank was robbed and someone got arrested and so in marketing uh, this movie, they created a story that the people that they were marketing to then lived and then posted and then told their friends about and it was recorded and it was, it was pushed out. And in that way, that's the most literal form of story-based marketing that I've seen. I've, there's a, several movies that have done that. I have, I have to admit that I, I want to know, did it work? And you know what's the return on investment? I, it's um, I'm kind of ruthless in that sort of thing because when I've been training other people with storytelling, they haven't even captured the basics. Sure. Um, you know, and and yet they go out yeah. and so you know I'm not saying if someone they, opened their Twitter account last month, I wouldn't tell them to start an op or alternate reality game that involves yeah. <laughs> going and, flying a plane overhead. That was just yeah. Well, no, I think it's a great idea, but there's so much low-hanging fruit that anybody that I work with, I really want to look at, you know, kind of what is your story. Like, literally, you know, Harley Davidson, what is your story? And then I love the storytelling uh, games and the uh, they have uh, 
trans storytelling now, and it's it's on all media. It's awesome. Can can you do me a favor, Annette? Um, and, and this was one of my questions, and we kind of glanced over it, but I think it's really important because what I'm starting to see, especially on Twitter, is and and you just brought it up, and I think it's a very great point is. What's the ROI? So just creating a story for the sake of creating a story isn't what we should be focused right. on. So what right. are some of the main components of a good, effective story? Well, there's so much out there. They've got infographics of you know the seven elements of a good story. And the truth is we, we must embrace the idea that storytelling is subjective. And so that any object of guidelines we create are made up and uh, the only way to evaluate them is are they useful so there are a lot of people who talk about uh, storytelling structure has you know beginning middle and an end and there's a somebody's the hero and then somebody uh, there's always the conflict and the problem with that is that it causes people to start to serve the master of the structure instead of the master of what emotion are you creating. So here's the way I go about it, is that uh, uh, storytelling is always going to be, a, a this is the way I see it, a virtual reality where we are recreating an experience. And you know, we talked that we had a whole thing about the experience economy and that sort of thing. And I think that it's what's led up to the fascination of storytelling because you can't create an experience unless somebody's living a story. When we start, I think that there's two stories that you have to tell. Who are you and why are you here? And the elements of those stories are simply pulling experiences that have actually happened that demonstrate who you are and who you aren't based on the values. Um, if, if, you know, for uh, Harley Davidson, the value is, one of the values is adventure and one of the values would be quality. And so what does that mean? Because quality could mean one thing for one person like uh, it could mean that something never changes, it's always the same, it's consistent. And for another person, quality means that you are constantly on the cutting edge and every product you create is new. The structure of beginning, middle, end, and uh, you know, seven elements isn't conducive to finding those unique descriptions and, and events and I really stick with true stories because if you're going to tell a story it's important that you actually are the story and if you can not find a story that proves your point are you sure you have a point right so I think defining what a story is is not as important as who are you and why are you here and it's a subtle difference but in terms of the stories you come up with and the results that you get, I think it's an important difference. Does that help? No, and I love, I love, I'm going to have to go back and listen to this again, like either tonight or tomorrow, because I love that one thing that you just said, and I'm trying to tweet it, which brings up a whole other conversation that I could have and story I could tell, but, but really, if you have to search for the point, do you really have a point? I mean, it, it was just, I mean, that it's so crystal clear, and I think so many of us just tell the story for the sake of telling a story, and we don't know what the point of it is. And, and somebody actually just tweeted out, can anybody, because everybody on Twitter is giving examples of all these brands that are doing commercials, right? And so, so somebody tweeted out, can anybody give me an example of a good, of a brand using storytelling that's not a commercial? Oh, and, yeah. I, and I haven't heard anything yet. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, that's one, I guess, not to be too self-promotional here, but, I mean, video production, a lot of what people are doing now are these things called brand films where they do maybe a three- to five-minute long storytelling-type video, and that's definitely not commercial as far as, like, on television or anything like that. I don't know if that's what they mean, or do they mean, like, narrative-type storytelling on Facebook, or, or are they referring to videos, or... I have, I have um, an example, and I think it's unique in this category. 
when brands decide to do green, uh, you know, initiatives or they decide to do uh, public service, social good initiatives, they inevitably create stories that are um, non-commercials, if you will, and if they do it well. For instance, Coke has just come out with, some, with a story that is about you're happier when you're up and moving about. So a Coke that, you know, uh, cr probably creates a significant a portion of our obesity is trying to undo a little bit of that with a story about how movement makes you happy. There recently was published like the top 10 uh, green videos and I think that's a good example of, of brand stories that aren't and they, their, their Coke for instance is completely within their story about happiness. You know they don't change their brand story about happiness but they interpret it through this new do you think that's a good example? I don't know. So the example that came to my mind is a company that I've brought up a couple times here called Valve. Uh, they make video games and they have a product called Steam and their corporate story of who they are and how they came to be has been online since they were online uh, because they wanted to make themselves known as a company that's not really in it for the bottom dollar. I mean, of course, they're trying to turn a profit, their company and all that, but uh, cash isn't king where they're from and they, they like community service and right. that's a hard claim for any company to make for anybody to say, yeah, right, I'm sure that cash isn't king. And so they opened up everything about their past. The guy who started it used to work at Microsoft, he worked on a big game, he got a lot of money so they had to have no outside investors, they never had to be purchased by anybody and in knowing that story and honestly it's the boringness of that story because it's all just you know what this guy did in the past and and how he didn't have to take money from anybody gives a lot of credibility to the fact that they're really not trying to screw anybody over yeah. which is a very nice thing it's it's even then I'm hesitant to say that that's not marketing because it's working on me and it's getting me to buy a product so it, that's uh, it's still an advertising story but it seems less so of one but that it's was not wrapped a around right well and it also I think goes to show that storytelling um, you know isn't about delivering just one quick story when you try to deliver one quick story, that's when you're making a commercial. When you yes. develop an entire story and you deliver it across your channels over time to your consumers, um, that's that's I think you know the the kind of storytelling that's that's not a commercial. Well, and that's like the Harley story has been the same since 19 whenever they they bought themselves back out in 1970 something, and you know who rides a Harley, you know what type of of group that is, you know, about that, you know that story. And it, my clients, I find that um, what, what you, Brew, what you were talking about, you know, consistently telling that story, it's also a function of living that story. And some, some people want to be aspirational, you know, this is who we want to be and this is who we, want, who, who we think the audience wants us to be. But if you're not actually that, then you're not living the story and so therefore your actions aren't telling the story. And it's all about living the story. Right. So I grew up as a summer camp counselor. I was one of the guys who told stories around a campfire and the reason that we told stories wasn't necessarily for entertainment. It was we have a kid who has a problem with hitting people. He needs to understand why everybody else isn't hitting each other this is the story that we all live and maybe he hasn't been exposed to that before maybe he doesn't know that that's a reality that that exists and so by pack packaging it into a hyper reality into a story that is truer than true that is bigger than big he can start to see that the world acts differently than the way that he acts and it's a slow change but it's still a change and this is the origin of all storytelling Mm -hmm. Because storytelling is the oldest form of influence in human history and the stories were originally evolved to create different social norms. So to, you know, and then you have religion which is one of the great sources if you want to study storytelling. I mean, you know, in terms of marketing, training, the whole thing. So the the stories that that are told that have been told over a couple thousand years there you've got an example of good storytelling. It's lasted because not only did it tell a good message, but um, it's well received. I have the feeling that you're, you're getting towards the point of the Campbell interviews, Joseph Campbell, uh, his interviews with, uh, I cannot remember his name right now, uh, but it's the hero with Bill a thousand Moyers? faces. 
Moyers. Yes, thank right. you. Yeah. Uh, great. If you're interested in storytelling, to everybody else out there, Bill Moyers and Joseph Campbell interviews yeah. are it's phenomenal. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. There's so much great stuff that is free. And when I started studying storytelling, I did workshops with these traditional storytellers who make like you know, two hundred and fifty dollars. You know, when they go to work in a school. And yet, they're an incredible wealth of information about storytelling. Yeah, yeah. agreed. I'm, I'm from the South, and we have a storytelling uh, heritage down here. And so you sit around a campfire, and it's just tell the tale. Yeah. All right, one, one, one note, too, as well, you know, about storytelling I want to mention is, you know, I think one of the other reasons why people, you know, this why storytelling is so important, too, isn't just for... You know, I think we're hardwired for stories. I think that they're important ways to get points across. But I also think that right now, you know, Americans definitely we work ourselves a little bit too much. I think we there is a little bit of an entertainment factor there too, for sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, certainly when we talk about, you know, I, I think that was you, Garrett, that were, was saying that when you get into a story, you you know you tend to follow it. Well, I think most people are when they get into it. Well, getting into something really just means that you're enjoying it, that it's entertaining to you. Because unless you actually work for the company or you're a vendor or something, maybe even a customer, there's no other interest in watching other than entertainment. So I, I think that's an important thing, too, I just want to mention, that there is an entertainment value to all of this stuff, as long as it's amusing or interesting. That's entertainment. I definitely agree. There's a lot of times when I've been presented stories from companies, and they're like, this is a great story. And it's like, well, that's because you work there, and you live it every day, and so yeah. you are very emotionally invested in that. If somebody right. else comes in and looks at that story, it's got nothing. It, it, right. has, to have, it has to be entertaining, very, very much so. And one of the things we face, oops, go ahead. Sorry, that's the, the thing that made it kind of interesting, Garrett, the story that you told about Valve, where you, like, you, where you made it clear that the story of that particular company was pretty boring. It really was just this guy talking about the things that he did in the past, not even like during, you know, a time where you could be a part of, you know, the success of the company, like, you basically said this is a this was a boring story that they told about the company, but after hearing the story, this narration, um, you feel like you can be a part of the success of the company by buying this product because they have nothing to rely on except for their customers. Um, and that's sort of something big that I don't know that we've touched on right now in this, um, you know, in this hangout that uh, one of the biggest touchstones of making a story that is successful for the person that's hearing it is leaving a spot for the listener or the reader or whatever to be part of it because otherwise if the story can't include you in some way in any way it's just bragging and you shut off and you're not interested at all in that so I think like one of the biggest things of making a story interesting and engaging and successful for any kind of ROI that you want out of the story, the other party has to be part of it. It has to include the other party in some kind of way. Otherwise, I mean, even the entertainment factor. Listen, I watched Pacific Rim over the over uh, last weekend. There is no part that I can play in the story that this movie sets forth. If you've seen it, you know why. But... What, you it mean you don't want to go fight, uh, fight the aliens or whatever? <laughs> I, it made me hopeful in a, in a weird, dark way that possibly, maybe, there is a rip in our own universe that will let crazy, weird, maniacal a aliens through and, and that Idris Elba will save all of humanity. Uh, Jillian, I love weird, dark. I think that's a lot of fun. And people get attracted to something that's different. So um, the, human, the human mind is designed to pay attention to what has changed. So even our visual uh, field is, only attends to what moves. And I think that that's a good metaphor to what we attend to when we're uh, going to listen to a story or not listen to a story. I mentioned before that I have six stories I think you need to know how to tell, but the last one is called an I Know What You're Thinking story. And I think that because the hook factors that are immediately available to us have been done so much that we, um, we are competing with 
um, a desensitization that uh, some of the stories, you know, if if it starts out like the Pirates of the Caribbean, um, you know, that may have that may have worked a couple of times a few weeks after after the movie, but by now, you know, you don't use that theme song. Does that make sense? Well, right, and that and that goes to your point earlier, I think, too, about why um, why using the same form for your stories doesn't work because if or why it's not you know so important that you have to use the similar beginning ending and have all these same right. structural Absolutely. things because if you do the same thing I mean just look at YouTube how many of these videos now you know they used to get people's attention you know they get kicked in the crotch and the cat plays the piano these videos aren't getting as many views as they used to because there's so many of them and they're not as interesting anymore. So well, isn't that the that's the fight of the the storyteller is to defeat the mental immune system of I have seen this idea and I have been exposed to this idea so now I have immunity to this idea uh, so I won't listen anymore. Uh, and so how, I like that. <laughs> so how is the storyteller do you come up with a new mental virus or mental, you know, uh, something that catches um, yeah, the whole chasing the virus thing is, um, uh, I have mixed feelings about that idea, but I do know that human beings are, have the exact same software that we had uh, a thousand years ago, <laughs> and that's called our emotions. And as we are overwhelmed, there are predictable emotions that, that need to be stimulated. So I think that if we look at those emotions, for instance, belonging. Uh, you know, belongingness is is something people are craving right now, and they get a simulated satisfaction through community. These community, uh, the, your kind of community, um, not just going out and, and volunteering. And so I think that's part of what we need to do when we're telling these stories: is to have that emotion of belongingness. Created by the the way and the stories we're telling. Well, and, and I I just I th there's a question that came in, but this is a perfect time to ask it because as I was listening before you answered, Net, I I think what we're talking about on you know specifically like the example of of you know with social media making everything so crowded and space being crowded. There's one thing to make that connection, but there's another thing about being found. And being found comes, you know, a large part of that is, is you know, much, it's not the storytelling aspect, it's the attention grabbing aspect of it, it's the SEO principles about it, it's the, the viral sharing standpoint of it. Um, but, but this brings in the question and why I wanted to bring it, because Molly Darden asked, um, you know, and this is specific to blogs, you know, uh, so she's asking, would you discuss the placement of story or stories in serious blogs? Would you start with the story or let the headline and the first graph sell the blog and then expound with one or more stories? Or would you just start with the story and try and sell the blog? So I'm kind of curious because, I mean, in my mind, I think they're kind of one and the same, but I'm kind of curious what you think of that. I am still experimenting with blogging myself. And so I'll, all of, anything I do, I need to have made it work myself before I could, I'll give anybody advice. And so, uh, you know, I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't decided what I believe about that. I, I'm going to defer to you guys uh, to let you guys answer that question. Well, can I say really quickly? I'm not quite sure that I understand the question. So, do you do you can you explain it in a different way, Tim? Well, I think she she got to the same point that I was I was bringing up about you know the difference between you know connecting emotionally with the story and grabbing the attention to get them to actually read. I, I think the, the the definition and the word usage of blogs and stories and are are kind of you know making this confusing, but I think the intent was, do you got do you have to grab somebody's attention before you can start warming them up to tell the story, or do you have to tell the story? You know, can you tell the story first? And what I'm saying is, I think they're one and the same. I think the attention grabbing aspect is a critical component of any story. Yeah. Well, I'll start so, start with you know should start with a title and uh, you know at the very least that's a that should be an attention grabbing title you know they say don't judge a book by a cover but I think almost everybody does and I, I think that's the same with stories too. I, I might um, add that um, a lot of always follow your audience um, I, I'm accustomed to coaching people to write for a CMO audience 
where you have just a fraction of a millisecond to catch that person's attention in the headline and in the first paragraph. So uh, getting back to what Annette said about um, emotion, I try to create an emotional connection right away in the first paragraph and then let the details of the story unfold after that first paragraph just because my audience is only giving me a fraction of their attention right away and I have to sell a benefit right away so there's a little bit of a conflict of selling a benefit to a CMO but you can still do that by creating that emotional bond in the first in the first paragraph so I, in go ahead in marketing I'm a, I'm a big fan of throwing people into the middle of a story um, which is an example of that would be I used to do lead generation and I would send people emails and I knew that they would go to spam filters or never be read. So the email would say, I know that you're not going to read this. I'm going to be calling you later today and I'm sending you this email as reference to the things that I will be talking about and the information that you're going to want to see. They would never see that. Call them and I'd say, hi, I'm Garrett. I sent you an email earlier today. I didn't get your email. Don't worry about it. We're going to talk about it. And then I would tell them my story and say, if you want more information, just search your inbox for Garrett at Argyle, whatever. They would go back and they would realize that there was this entire backstory there that I had set up for them. And then they would be able to follow that backstory uh, through to a sale. And that was throwing them into the middle of the story by creating a beginning before they even knew that they were a part of it. That's cool. I, I think I have something to say that might be valuable. Um, I agree definitely that you know it's all the same. The story is is you know it, by my definition the story is even the typeface you use in your blog. Uh, so, but there's a distinction that between a statement and a fact, and then the story. And so a fact doesn't mean anything to anybody unless there's a story around it. And so when you're writing a blog you may get you may be get in love with your facts or statistics or um, you know what you, that you want someone to believe an attribute if you're in love with that then you've missed the story and so I think once you are committed to the story and the emotion then it's going to inform everything you do like um, I think that your story Garrett are you? Yeah. Garrett, your story has to do with surprise as well. And, and so I think that's a, that's a great element. And it, it also has to do, you're also creating an emotion of, um, there's a tiny bit of embarrassment that uh, this person is talking to someone and, and that they, you know, had ignored you before. And so that's a very important part of your story as well. I think it's a, a great, great it, it all goes back to the mental immune system of what, Im there's very specific emotions that, that salespeople sell in, in terms of story. It's, oh, this guy's called me four times. That causes an emotion in me, and I just, oh, I like, I, I, I just need to tell him, no, don't call me anymore. You're very used to that uh, emotion, and you have a, a defense set up for that emotion for when that call comes in. So if you're trying to get through to somebody, a little bit of embarrassment, a little bit of awkwardness, a little bit of goofiness, a little bit of something that they're not used to is enough to just say, this is a different conversation. I should learn how to handle this. And it gets you in. Good idea. I think another, uh, if I could add to that, another great way to create that emotional connection early on, whether you're writing a blog post or uh, creating a visual story, is the art of visual storytelling. Have a great graphic. Um, a great Instagram video or a Vine video embedded in your in your in your blog, whatever the topic may be. Um, there's nothing like a picture to create an emotional bond right away. And um, I'm also interested in what what everybody has to say about the future of visual storytelling. It's something we've not talked about a little very much today. But I mean, when you look, at, you've got General Electric on Vine creating yeah. incredible visual stories. I mean, they're they're telling a story about science and learning. Yeah. in six seconds on Vine. Uh, you see the National Hockey League doing the same thing on Vine. I'm just curious about your, your thoughts about the, you know, the role of visual story and storytelling and the way we tell our stories as marketers. Well, I, visual storytelling is, is incredibly powerful. A picture is worth a thousand words. Um, you can create an enormous amount of emotion. Now, having come from behind, you know, I lost those three years, I immediately saw that the, the 
potential for, for images and visual storytelling and realized that I had no skills, you know. And so I just went to a, a workshop in multi, for multimedia, very intensive, and I chose to do it at the Institute for Documentary Studies. Now, the reason I did is because I think the tradition of TV and print advertising is leading in the wrong direction. And I think that the discipline of documentary uh, images and video is a much better uh, training ground for us to create what you guys were, you were talking about earlier, something that's not a commercial, but it is actually a story. And so I have begun to experiment with images and uh, just did my own little video uh, documentary. What I've learned is that sourcing images takes a lot of time and in many cases it's actually worth the time. But you can't know ahead of time whether you're going to be able to find something and if, if you don't find something then that time feels wasted. Now this is something that people that occurs when people are looking for stories as well. It's not that easy to find a great story. And I don't think you should spend any time telling a story unless it's a great story. There are times when right. it's taken me two years to find the right story. Um, and there's some stories I still haven't found. Well, that means that in terms of a discipline, this sense of urgency that we all have when we're involved in social media, or at least that I have when I'm involved in social media, can be counterproductive when you're trying to find a story. So this an image is, is the same thing. I think that images are incredibly powerful and can be incredibly hard to find. Well, I, I would just add to that too. Obviously, they're incredibly hard to find, and I, I'm seeing a lot of people just forcing it where they're putting out bad images and I actually think visual storytelling might be the demise of certain companies if they don't get their act together yeah. because it's like it's destroying their brand. You know, they using iPhone photos to display their products, and 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 I don't mean that in a casual social way because there's nothing wrong with a quick pic of something. But I've seen people trying to use these things, you know, use images. They don't know how to light them. They just they're just trying their best. They find something or illegally just searching on Google and or grabbing images and and people. Disputing that too. I mean, there's a lot of reputational problems when you don't know what you're doing with the images and visually. So well, gotta be careful. I think that, that brands need to treat visual storytelling just like they treat social media. Have standards. Yeah. Right. Um, right. All good brands should have social media standards for employees. They need to have the same thing for visual storytelling. How to do it right. Embarrassing background mm -hmm. to avoid. Uh, how to not you know the, the kind of etiquette things, but also more of the um, how to how to tell a story in a powerful way. Um, not just the etiquette part. I think that's what you're getting at, Aaron. Right. I, I do think every brand needs to be thinking about visual storytelling because consumers are leaving brands in the dust with our use of Instagram. Um, right. But they just need to do it right. You know, there's a right I, way and a wrong way to do it. And I'd like to point out that what we're now talking about is art. And so that's another discipline that I believe needs to be brought in in terms of our training on finding images. As an artist, I, I paint and I, I, um, I sculpt. Nah, let's not even say I sculpt. <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty lousy at that. So I'm a painter <laughs> and, and I, I take lessons and I'm learning more about choosing images from my painting lessons than I am from you know any sort of business oriented training. I think that that's something we ought to start thinking about. There's a man named Will Eisner, um, and in the comic book world, like I said, I'm a big fan of comics. If an award is won, you win an Eisner. That's the oh. highest uh, award that you can win. He wrote a book in the 70s or 80s called Sequential Art, which is all about how to tell a story through sequential images, so how to uh, evolve a story over time, um, and what it means to actually have a, a, a box around your art or to to the gap between a bo two boxes and, and what happens in that time to a person who is reading it. Um, and it's a very in-depth look at how images and how sequential art can tell a story. Um, Will Eisner, it's a very interesting book. You know, I believe that books like that 
are timeless. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the idea of sequence is something that's timeless. And um, one of the things when I'm studying group dynamics is I've discovered that, that we really haven't updated what we know about groups because groups haven't changed. And I think that responding to storytelling is something that hasn't changed. And using a book like that, transferring it into the idea of sequence over time, you know, the gap between those, those I think that we can learn so much if we test it. You know, I'm a big believer in A-B testing. Well, the only thing I would say that might be changing is people's patience levels. You know, I think the general form of stories doesn't change necessarily, but if you take too long to tell your story, I think that is going to be a problem in a modern era where I think maybe a thousand years ago you had a lot more time around the fire at night or something like that. See, but, uh, yeah. I thought the same thing, too, until I heard a report that said, like, yes, everybody is, is digesting tweets, but we're also marathoning seasons on Netflix. Yeah. So. To, to say that we're losing our interest is only looking at one side well, of the story. I mean, like, the pacing. Even those things that marathons they're watching on television, the pacing has picked up. I think, you know, we're, you know, in the video production world, we're almost cutting every second or two seconds yeah. now, whereas I think back in, you know, even 20 years ago, people were taking three or four seconds before they started cutting to something new because people have shown that they don't have that patience for but, well, but, that, but that's a specific medium that you're you're talking right, about. Right, but I, I think with blog posts too, you know, let's go into the written word. You know, these marathon, ridiculously long blog posts, no one's reading those unless you got some groundbreaking information. People want. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting. I'm sitting. I'm going to prove my point right here. Okay. All nine of you are sitting on a hangout with me for sixty minutes. Good, I got point. Good point. Minutes. Yeah, but there's and, a lot and, of stuff going it's on. It's true, it. and there well, is kind of already some data that says that longer. Longer form blog posts are um, attracting the long-term traffic that you want. Not right. necessarily every single day. Everybody's reading that long blog post. And I every think person you tweeted to, but a lot. That's like known as a, an evergreen kind of content where people can refer back, and you can keep on editing and adding more if you want to. And then that becomes resource traffic that and is valuable that, as well. So people are key. digesting it. It's just at a different rate and a different timeline. I'd like to add some old wisdom that <laughs> applies. My original uh, experience was in direct marketing. And you know that all of the you know, junk mail you got, there was stuff you went through and through and through, and yet the statistics proved in A-B testing that the longer stuff was often what got people's information. I think that, it, that looking at the number of seconds that somebody looks at something can equally represent the quality of the somethings that are being, you know, presented. So, you know, causation is not necessarily uh, from correlation. So you have a correlation there that people are only looking at it for a split second, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the causation is patience. The causation could also be the quality of the material. Just like um, Janice, is that your name? I'm sorry. Janice was saying. Jillian. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's me. Oh, Jillian. Yeah. Jillian. Sorry. Yeah, just like you're saying. It's, it depends on the, the quality of it. And um, Tim, like you said, it, it, we've been here for an hour. Uh, also, doesn't it? Um, isn't this a factor of people's personalities as well? Because um, one of the things I, I took a very small like copywriting course, um, and one of the things it taught us was that there, like even in reading, you have three types of people: someone who just wants the information really, really quick and move on. You have people that want to sort of like dive a little bit deeper into it, and then you have people who really do want to get all the way to the bottom of that post or that sales page or whatever. Um, so I, I I think that. I, I, for me, if somebody tr um, takes like a long time to get a point across, um, my mind starts wandering. But I know right. that there's people who are different than that that they they like to hear those that the longer point drawn out. I, I think my main point was really more on average. I obviously there's people that will read long books, and there are people that won't read long books. But I think my point was on average. We have so much data coming at people. They've learned. They've grown. They've changed how they operate. And I, I don't know that that's really disputable as far as that. I think on average, 
it's gone down, but certainly longer things for sure. I mean, I'll hang so out with you, Tim, for maybe five hours if you want. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, like you. I, you know, I think what you say, Aaron, is spot on because it informs what we do. And and so like no no principle or belief is is um, important ex if if it doesn't actually inform what we do. And so what you're saying is that what we've got to do is create things that communicate more in less time. And I am a believer in that. I think that I probably won't produce any videos anymore that are longer than a minute at max two. I believe that you're right. However, I think those stats that we're talking about are going to change because we're now coming up on a generation that is the new, the generations that are coming up are the first generations that have been living with this stuff from day one. And until we see data on how they're reacting, I think it's going to change because we're most of us here have adapted over to this. This wasn't how we how we started our lives. Right. So I think those stats. I think it's the whole space, the whole social space, and the whole thing is still too young yet to actually say this is exactly what's happening. I think it's going to be changing rapidly, quickly. Right. This has been a great conversation. I, I do want to keep it going, but we are at our hour, so unfortunately we have to uh, maybe come back and talk about this as a unique topic unto itself um, at a future Hangout, but this is great. Um, and yes, uh, Garrett just mentioned in the chat, for those of you that are watching can't see it, but those of you in here, um, we do have after parties. If you're on the Hangout and you want to hang out for a little bit and are available, you can. We just won't be broadcasting it live. So, um, And uh, Annette, I really want to thank you so much for being our guest today. It, it was great. And I, I do want to just, you know, I know you just said you went to that um, that filmmaking, you know, documentary filmmaking, you know, session. And I, I just, I had somebody tell me, go to screenwriting and and filmmaking, you know, type of conferences and sessions, and you will learn so much by doing that. Yeah. And I, I have been listening to some podcasts, and it's just been eye opening to me because it's not marketing speak; yeah. it's story. Yeah. <laughs> and and I think that's so important for us as community managers to understand that, and really anybody in business. So so Annette, thank you so much for being here, and I encourage everybody to go check out her site at just AnnetteSimmons.com. You'll see all her books on there, all her services that she offers to uh, businesses as far as consulting and speaking, and. Um, I would offer anybody that was in the Hangout today, you do not have to go on Twitter because I already put it out on Twitter, but if you were in here and would like to get a copy, I will personally buy you a book of Annette's um, uh, The Story Factor. If you just email me, tell me, I will get, pick one person out of everybody that emails me by the, the end of tonight. So I will make somebody happy. I've, it's become kind of a tradition <laughs> for me to do each week when we have authors in here, and I'm, I'm loving it because everybody is so appreciative of the books that they get. So um, That's a great I, idea. Yeah, it's it's it really is. So I'm giving one away to the audience on Twitter and one away to anybody in here that if you tell me you're interested in getting it. So um, and all I ask is that you pay it forward. If you do get it and you do uh, read it and enjoy it, let Annette know. Let other people know because that's what we're all about. So <laughs> um, so thank you everybody for joining us today. Have a great weekend. Um, we will see you next Friday at 2 p.m. on Community Manager Hangout. And if you're interested in coming up from Toronto on August 17th, we'd love to have you join us at Community Manager on. Conference. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care now, guys. All right.